Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening um, human resources meeting. I'd like to start by pointing out the fire and evacuation procedures for uh, this meeting. Um, there are no fire alarm tests scheduled for this evening. Therefore, if the alarm sounds, please evacuate the building immediately. The fire exits are located at the rear and side of this room. Go down the stairs and meet in the War Memorial Park. This meeting is being webcast and very good evening to everyone watching uh, at home or in their offices. Uh, the first thing to do is to receive apologies for absence. And I already have apologies for Councillor Mrs. Osselton, Councillor Goodison and Councillor Potter. Do we have any more? I don't think there are looking around the room, resign and replace. Uh, no. Um, I don't believe there are any decl declarations of conflicts of interest. But are there any anyway, as my Vice Chairman um, reminds me, I have to ask you. No. Okay, thanks. There are no urgent items. So it leaves me just to now confirm the minutes, which you should all have a, a copy of. Are there any questions or issues with the minutes? Okay, if I can just move, if I can move from the chair that these are accepted, can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Dunlop, thank you. Is that all agreed? Thank you. I'll just sign the minutes. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Just ask. It's very off-putting having three of you here this evening, because you're sitting there in front of me, and then when you're speaking behind you, there is actually a much bigger version of you not quite speaking at the same time as you're speaking, and then behind that person up there, there's a picture of another you. So there are three lots of us. I wonder if we could just pull those things across or hide them, because it's we don't need that for this evening, do we? Yeah. Thank you. It's not the first time you said that I'm larger than life. Or the first time you failed to speak in time with your mouth. So very remiss of me. I'd like also to welcome, of course, as always, Mick Butler from Unison and, 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 and Nick Collins from the Staff Forum. Welcome to you, gentlemen. Feel free to join in. I expect that you will and hope that you will as well. Um, continuing on, um, member and public participation. Um, I don't see anyone uh, at the moment who wants to participate. There are no referrals from other committees on the council uh, from the Council and no issues referred by Cabinet. Before I move to the agenda, I'm hoping that the committee will agree, um, just really for the reasons of efficiency with Officer Time, I would like to take these papers in a different order, simply so that uh, uh, Tim Firefield, who is with us for some of the papers, can do his two papers and then leave. Um, and if no one objects, what I'd like to do is take the papers in the following order. Paper C first, then paper D, at which point Mr Fifield will be able to leave, and then take paper B and paper E. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, thank you for that. So we're now on uh, paper C. Um, it's timely that we look at the staff code of conduct. It hasn't been visited by this borough since 2006. Our head of service for human resources, um, Shella Smith, has put a lot of work into this one, and Shella is now going to present the new proposed 
staff code of conduct. Over to you, Shannon. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the purpose of this report, as Councillor West has said, is to present you with a revised staff code of conduct for approval. And in the committee's terms of reference, it is for yourselves to um, approve this. Um, essentially, the code of conduct explains the expectations that the council has of its staff. Um, and it's been reviewed to ensure that it reflects the council's vision and values um, and is easier to understand by its intended audience, i.e. the staff of the council. Um, we've also reduced the volume of text by removing some of the duplication of policies and instead we signed post people in the revised version of the Code of Conduct to where they can find more information in the relevant policy. But the overarching content and purpose of the document remain the same. Um, since we submitted the report, um, apologies, but we have picked up one error, which is on page 26 of 70 um, in the documents that you have in front of you, right at the top of the page under the um, subtitle Impartiality, Relationships and Personal Interests. The first line should read, you must ensure the decisions you make and the actions you take are fair. So apologies for that um, oversight. Um, uh, colleagues from the staff forum and from Unison were involved in um, commenting on the original version of this policy and helping us redraft the new con code of conduct and have positively endorsed the version that you see before you today. Um, so on that basis it's, it's recommended that the committee approves the new staff code of conduct in Appendix A subject to the amendment I've just outlined but obviously I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Councillor Mrs Baker. Um, first of all, I, I, I applaud this. It is far simpler, far easier to read, far clearer. So um, that's really good to see. I would only ask, on what colour paper or what colour printing is it when it's circulated? Because I think it fails the guidelines for... Um, readability on what colour because we've only seen the, the black absolutely yeah it's it's in a document much like these other ones that we've produced so this is the people's strategy um, and then this is our change plan as well so it would be mainly blue and white with black text in the main um, except on some of the darker ones blocks that you can see like the public money one that would be a very dark blue with a white with white writing and just just to come back is it actually um, has is it assessed for readability against the normal guidelines I can't sort of I hoped it would be thank you councillor leak I'd um, just like to comment on page 23 of 70 this is on personal interests. Um, the Audit Governance and Accounts Committee has been asking that um, officers' interests be recorded, but I'm advised that that has been the case for some time. But I was a little surprised that um, that couldn't be open to the public because of the likely breaches of the Data Protection Act. Um, and I was wondering why that applies to officers but not to members. I'm interested to have a response. If I can start, and then Tim Fifield, who's a solicitor, may want to um, chip in. Um, as I understand it, the um, obligations on members derive from the member code of conduct which is laid down in statute and as office holders um, the requirements on you are laid out in that statute that you do have to um, have your register of interests open to public scrutiny and that also the types of interests that you'd have to declare are wider than those which apply to staff um, staff do have to um, register interests and um, we would keep a record of any interests that are registered um, and any um, mitigations or um, other remedies that are put in place in order to accommodate or deal with those uh, particular interests. But in terms of the disclosure, um, the, so our staff are covered by employment law and there isn't the same obligation to have that record open to members of the public. Um, but Tim might want to elaborate on that. Uh, I don't have anything further to add on that. I think that's quite a clear explanation. Um, just to say that 
um, members are their responsibilities are very much statute driven as opposed to officers in this circumstance there aren't similar provisions as there are to members as officers to make these disclosures and have them or and have them published in the same way as, as members would councillor leak um, do officers have to complete a form just as members do so that um, each category of uh, of interest is, is actually written down or because I think you were slightly implying that it was almost ad hoc but I'd like to know that it was a bit more than that. The way that it's done at the moment is that on an, on an annual basis every head of service or senior manager should um, send a reminder around to their staff um, to ask them to register any interest and there's an explanation that goes with that. We have just um, adopted, uh, sorry, adapted the process so that it becomes part of our HR Pro database which will automatically trigger an email to all staff on an annual basis reminding them that they need to register any interest and there's a form that they have to fill out and some guidance that goes with that and then a record of that is maintained on our HR Pro database. If there are no more questions, uh, Councillor Sanders. Um, if I may, Chair, I had two questions or points, really. Uh, on page 25 of 70, which is the picture version, um, on the left-hand column, uh, under working in a political environment and um, the last paragraph, I'm not quite sure of... Um, why we need whether politically restricted or not. I'm not actually certain what that means. Um, and in any case, why do we need it? It's a fairly straightforward statement that you must not allow your own personal or political opinions to interfere with your work. Um, so I, I would suggest that since it can, it's a little bit confusing in the first place, it would be better just simplify it by taking that out. That's my first point. And my second point is on the other column, under public money, it says you should strive to ensure value for money for the local community and to avoid legal challenge to the authority. I'm a little concerned about that because you can't actually stop a legal challenge to the authority. And I would hate to think that people started making the wrong decisions just to avoid a legal challenge to the authority. I mean, there may be times when you have to make a decision which might inspire a, a challenge, but it could be the, absolutely the right decision to make. And this would rather imply that if there was any possibility of a legal challenge, you shouldn't decide to do that. I'm not sure that's really what we want to encourage people to do. Thank you, Councillor Sanders. In, in response to your first point, absolutely, there's no problem with taking that. We do have some posts which are politically restricted, but people who aren't in politically restricted posts probably wouldn't understand what that meant. Um, and as it applies equally, whether you're politically restricted or not, I think it's absolutely the right thing to remove that, as you have suggested. Um, in response to your second point, um, we could perhaps change the wording. So you should strive to ensure value for money to the local community we could say something seek to avoid legal challenge to the authority um some, something along those lines councillor mark seek to stay within the law but I, I think that would be acceptable i mean the problem with it is for instance that we have um, challenges on planning applications, which can be legal challenges on plan planning applications, but you know we have people make decisions to the best of their ability, and we wouldn't want to start saying, "Well, we're not going to make that decision because we're worried about the legal challenge." We could just remove that second part of the sentence, so it just says you should strive to ensure value for money to the local community and the authority. So it's just about seeking to be striving to ensure value for money instead. Members be happy with that. Just, just for clarity on this one, Sheller is is making notes of all these little modifications. And before we we vote on this one, um, I'm going to um, um, put put those to you. We're going to vote on those just to make sure we know exactly what modifications we're improving. Mick from Unison, would you like to speak? 
Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's just just one concern. It's it's on page 24 of 70, and it's uh, point, uh, 6.3. Uh, where it says all staff will be advised of the new staff code of conduct once agreed and they will be required to read it and raise any queries with the line manager. We do have some employees that actually are unable to read um, so we need to look at that, perhaps do a briefing in the areas where we have those type of work. Thank you, Mick. Yeah, we had already thought about that, actually, um, and what we would plan to do is exactly as you suggested, is some briefings for um, various teams to ensure that this is explained to people face-to-face uh, -face so that if, are, if there are any reading issues, then hopefully those could be avoided. Thank you. Okay, I mean, I, I, I was going to for it open to the open debate, but we've kind of covered a lot of that within within questions. Unless anyone else has any points or questions, what I'd like to do now is is just get Shella to clarify the little things which are going to be changed, and then I'll, I'll I'll ask someone to propose and second that we can just move it. Thank you, Chair. So on page 25 of 70, under the heading Working in a Political Environment, the last paragraph will now read, You must not allow your own personal political opinions to interfere with your work. Under Public Money, the last paragraph will now read, You should strive to ensure value for money to the local community and to the authority. And then on page 26, at the top, the first sentence will now read, You must ensure the decisions you make and actions you take are fair, etc. Is everyone happy with that? Agreed. Super. Ag agreed. Lovely. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And thanks um, to you, Shella, and the team for the work that you've put in to that as well. We're now going to look at the whistle-blowing policy. This borough has had one, but in view of recent changes in legislation, we've had to look at that one again. And I'd like to hand over now to uh, Tim Fifield, who is one of our solicitors, to, to, to basically set out the new whistleblowing policy. Tim, over to you. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, I'm, I'm actually a non-practicing solicitor, um, just for any clarification. Um, on the 25th of April 2013, the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act 2013 received royal assent, and the Act included amendments relating to whistleblowing, and all of the relevant provisions of the Act came into effect on the 25th of June this year. Uh, I've attached a copy of the relevant legislation at Appendix D, but in summary, um, Section 17 inserts a public interest test in relation to disclosures qualifying protection. Section 18 of the Act gives an employment tribunal the power to reduce workers' compensation if the protect, uh, protected disclosure is not made in good faith, i.e. if it is n not made um, sincerely or honestly without regard to the outcome. Section 19 of the Act makes a worker's employer vicariously liable for any detriment the worker suffers as a result of making a protected disclosure uh, from any other person in the employer's employ. And Section 20 of the Act extends the definition of the term worker um, to other types of employees. The most important impact of this amended legislation is that the requirement for a disclosure to be made in good faith has now been removed. The, the effect of this is that there could potentially be an increase in the number of disclosures. However, this is countered by the requirement that in order for the disclosure to qualify for protection, it must be in the reasonable belief of the worker be made in the public interest. A copy of the proposed amendments to the policy is attached to Appendix B. Um, just a couple of typos to point out. Um, the first one is on page 41 of 70, and at paragraph 6.2, it should say Head of Governance and Monitoring Officer. And additionally, on page 43, at paragraph 10.1, it should state November instead of September. In a, um, a, a copy of the proposed amendments is attached as Appendix B. Um, uh, just in summary, the old paragraph 3.1 has been amended to reflect the protection of workers from harassment or victimisation as a result of making a protected disclosure. A new paragraph 3.5 has been inserted into the policy to reflect the removal of the good faith requirement. 
and there have been some other minor amendments to other paragraphs within the policy um, just to improve clarity really. Um, as well as approving the policy, members are recommended to give delegated authority to the Head of Human Resources to make amendments to the whistleblowing policy where minor legislative or administrative changes impact on the actual content of the policy. This will allow amendments such as this to be made swiftly uh, without the need to come back to committee. And if many, any members have any questions about the policy, I'm happy to answer them. Tim, thank you very much for that. Well done. Um, any questions from members? Councillor Sanders, please. Sorry about this, everybody. Um, I'm not really clear why we need paragraph 3.5. Um, which is allegations not made in good faith. Since the the presumption now, well, since there is no question of good faith anymore within it, why do we need a paragraph that says that you don't have to make it in accordance with something that isn't required anyway? It seems to me that what's happened here is we're actually just reflecting a change in the law, which is not necessary to be enshrined within the policy itself. Yeah, of course. Um, this was this. Um, was, um, yes, this was one of the main changes. Obviously, the the, the rule of good faith. Um, we felt it necessary to 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 include something in relation to good faith. Obviously, because any disclosure that is not made in good faith could have an effect on any sort of compensation an employee may receive. Uh, we didn't feel it necessarily to, necessary to go into that much detail, i.e., to because that may put some workers off making a, a disclosure of that sort. Um, but in relation to actually the content of 3.5, no, I, I completely can't see where you're coming from. If, if it's no longer a, a requirement, then. I'm happy for it to be to be with, removed. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was just reading it again to see if there's anything else we need. Yeah, of course. Councillor Matz, go ahead. Have in the say the last five ten years have any allegations been made not in good faith. Are we going from history here or anything? If, if I can answer that, um, that's not the case. Um, I mean, allegations have been made under the previous whistleblowing, or the current, I should say, rather, whistleblowing policy. Um, generally, those are made in good faith. Um, and, the, and actually, the test probably wouldn't be that different. I think possibly one reason for um, including it was that people are still used to the old version of this so might think about the need to make things in good faith but I think as Councillor Sanders says it's not essential for it to be there at all. I don't think it would detract from the meaning of the policy if it was removed. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've, I've read it and I, I agree that paragraph 3.5 can be removed without affecting the, the rest of the policy. Uh, Nick Butler from uh, from the staff forum would like to speak. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Nick, Nick Collins. Um, uh, I'm just uh, turning to page 57 of 70, uh, section 5.5. Uh, where it actually states you may invite your trade union or professional association to raise a matter on your behalf. I wasn't quite sure whether a professional association would actually get involved in these sorts of matters and question the relevance of having that in there. Maybe it would be worth just leaving trade union forum rep, for example. Would you like to answer that one, uh, Tim? With apologies to you, Nick, for getting your name wrong. Yeah, of course. Um, which paragraph was it again? Yes, of course. I mean, that was just to extend it to if the, the, the employee, employee didn't want to raise the concern themselves, just to extend it to whomever would want to raise the concern on their behalf. Uh, if you don't think professional association is um, 
relevant and it can be removed if you think they're more likely to go to uh, their trade union. Um, it, I think this is referring to, for example, um, I'm just trying to think of any, well, myself, for example, I'm a member of the Chartered Institute of Personal Development, um, and there um, may be an occasion when I want the CIPD to raise an issue on my behalf because I feel um, that it will have more clout, I suppose, if it comes from my professional body as opposed to me. Um, the same would apply to a management accountant, for example, or a solicitor. Um, so I actually think it is probably worthwhile to retain that within the policy um, because it's not restrictive. It, it's hopefully making it easier for people to disclose. Would anyone else like to comment on that issue? Because before we go any further, just, just to get before we go ahead of ourselves, um, there was a proposal um, to basically strike out 3.5, correct? Yeah. Uh, well, we didn't actually no, we didn't actually move it and formally accept it. Um, is, is everybody in agreement that 3.5 will be struck out? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, that, that's done formally. Any more questions or points pertaining to this paper? Um, if someone would like to propose that paper, please. Will we accept it and move it? Thank you, Councillor. Mrs. Deaches. Um, okay, is that, is that agreed, everyone? Yeah, it agreed. Thank you very much. Paper B is a, a, a standard regular report which comes to this uh, committee and to present the operational management issues into an update. Once again, Head of Service, Shella Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report focuses on the first two quarters of 2013-14, so it is an interim report and a more full and detailed report will be provided um, at the end of the year. Um, but um, in the meantime, um, you'll see that the workforce profile is largely unchanged in terms of gender, age, um, full-time, part-time split. Um, and that's a, similar to the trend that we've seen over recent years. There has been a small increase in the number of employees aged 16 to 25. That's mainly because we've increased the number of apprentices at the council. Uh, we now have seven apprentices, um, which is shortly to increase to nine. Um, in terms of sickness absence, you'll see that the main focus of this report is, is in terms of the sickness absence levels at the Council for the first two quarters. Um, and the picture for quarters one and two shows a reduced level of absence, but we know from historical data that absence for quarters three and four tends to be higher. Um, and if that trend was seen again this year, then that could potentially result in absence levels which are above the Council's target of eight days on average per employee. So in response to that, the HR team have been working with the senior management group to try and nip any um, of those sorts of issues in the bud. Um, and we've taken some proactive steps, which are outlined in this report in paragraphs 4.4 .4 to 4.10. Those include revising the trigger points and monitoring periods for absence and um, any members who've been on the committee for a while will know that we've previously used the Bradford factor as our trigger point. Um, we've, we've found through the research that we've done that staff and managers find that difficult to actually um, understand and that it doesn't really um, tell you what the actual impact of the absence is having on the business and service delivery. Um, so instead, we've decided to change our trigger point um, and we have changed that so that it's now 2% of working time or two occasions of absence in the last six months. So that's now our new trigger point for monitoring absence and anyone who meets that trigger point will be met with and a discussion will be had with them about the reasons for their absence, if there's any underlying causes and so on. 
We've also given all managers a clear performance review target in their mid-year appraisal to um, improve or at least maintain if their absence levels are already very good, um, the um, absence levels within their team. Um, we have continued to provide access to a number of support services for staff, such as uh, promoting the counselling service, promoting um, free Flu, so I can never say this, free flu vaccination vouchers um, and our occupational health service. And we're also doing a number of other initiatives around well-being generally, which have included things like offering on-site clinical massages for staff, which staff pay for themselves, but it's easier for them to obviously have that um, arranged if it's if it's here on site for them. Um, we've been supporting a number of national campaigns such as uh, Movember, for example, which is um, concerned with men's health. Um, Wear it Pink Day, which is around uh, breast cancer issues for women. Um, we've offered free health checks for men and women, which have been um, offered through the Sports Trust, um, and various initiatives like that to try and encourage people to take more responsibility for their health and well-being, as well as um, obviously doing the more robust work that we're doing around the actual sickness absence procedure and, and so on. Um, so hopefully well, members will see that we are trying to take a proactive stance to ensure that absence levels by the end of the year, uh, we are reporting to you a much better picture in terms of those rates. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report, Shella. Um, I'm sure there are some questions on that one from the floor. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Shella, for the report, which is very detailed and, and very informative. Um, I, I've got a question, and I'm, I'm sure I should know the answer to this, but on page 19 of 70, table 12, um, the section on gender, I, I, I was a little bit puzzled by the no value. What, what, what does that actually mean, please? It's where people have chosen not to answer the question. So it's the same as prefer not to answer. It's just recorded in our recruitment system as no value. Councillor Sanders. I'm not sure this is a question or a comment, um, but I'll put the two together. I'm still struggling um, with this question of um, getting to understand the reasons behind and the impacts of uh, the days lost um, for the very simple reason that whilst we have a separation at the top of page 16 of 70 between um, absence due to short-term absences and absence due to long-term absences when we're looking at the days lost by either the cause um, of those reasons for absence or in fact the impact by customer service it isn't split so, for instance, we can look at customer services who have a, a very much higher level than almost anybody else of 7.5 days lost um, per person. But what we don't know is whether that might actually be accounted for by one or possibly two people um, out of the 225, or sorry, out of the 34 who are em employed in that, in that area. Um, I really, for us to be able to understand where the impact's being felt, I think we've got to split that out and each thing that we look at, see short-term and long-term absences, because um, otherwise it gives a... I mean, when you have a situation where 60% of days lost is actually for um, abs long-term absence, that can have a really disturbing impact on the figures that when you're looking at. Oh. Yes. Um, yeah, when we went back in the minutes, we did say that we would produce this information for you so I have done that but when we actually revisited the webcast what members had actually asked for so the, our understanding of what members had actually asked for was a breakdown of um, for example particularly around anxiety stress depression you had asked for a breakdown by um, business unit as to how many individuals in each business unit had suffered from anxiety stress depression I've got both bits of information here the um, I was nervous about producing the information around anxiety, stress, depression because for some of the smaller business units it for, will be, for example, one individual and whilst members might not know who that person was, um, I was um, concerned that members of staff might know who that person was. In terms of table four though, um, I can say, for example, that customer services um, 
of those 225 days lost, there were 21 staff who contributed to that 225 days. Um, so if that is what members are asking for, then certainly next time we can produce that information for you. But I do have that information here, which I can go through with you, if that would help. Yeah, if I may, Chair. Um, yeah, it's really just to understand whether, if we see that there is something, a figure which is sticking out like that one clearly sticks out because it's double the average rate. Is it sticking out because there happened to be maybe two, two people in there broke their legs skiing together or something and then therefore were off work for three months? Um, that could have an enormous impact on it. And then the others maybe were just off with a, a day's flu or something. Um, so th to try and work out where we have problem areas. That's what we're all really looking using this for, is to find out where we've got problem areas are, and are we dealing with those particular problem issues. And I, I feel at the moment the information is just at slightly too high a level to enable us to get to that. I mean, it doesn't mean to say that if there is a situation where there may, might be some particular staff member being exposed, fine, that doesn't necessarily need to come to committee, but it, at least we need to have comfort that it is being picked up along the way. If I may just add that in terms of the work that we do with the business units and each section, we do break the absence down into that exact detail and we will break it down by individual level. So the managers will know exactly who in their team has been off for how long with what absences. They'll know whether the trends in their particular team are long term, short term. They'll know whether there are any particular patterns around stress, for example. Um, so we will go into all of that level at individual business unit. So just to reassure you, we do have that information and we most certainly do discuss it in detail with um, the managers of those teams and indeed with the director and chief executive. I may just finish off this point because the same thing would apply if you were looking at table six there. It would be really good to know of those 405 days lost whether there was one person that perhaps, I mean I can't remember how many days there were in quarters two and, and um, one and two, but it must be somewhere around a sort of couple of hundred days, I should think, something like that. Whether one person accounts for half of that, or whether, or two people account for virtually all of it, um, even though there's four, 14 individuals. And because they're off for a long term, that's what I mean. Yes, certainly. If it would help um, for for the end of year report, if we broke down, say, the top reason in particular, so anxiety, stress, depression, if we break that down a little bit more, um, probably not by business unit, but certainly so that you can perhaps see the length of time those 14 individuals have been off for, um, we could certainly do that for that absence reason. And we can also then include on table four, as well as the number of staff in the business unit, we will also include an additional column which shows the number of staff with an absence in that period. So hopefully that combined data will give you a better picture of what the issues are for each particular area. Sorry, that will be fine. Thank you for that. And also thank you for introducing me to a new word, geniturinary. Never come across that before. I'd like to thank Councillor Sanders for that point because it is clear, looking at this, that just using a mean average means that the data can be become extremely skewed if one or two members of staff are responsible for 90% of the um, of, of the absence it's almost like the 80 20 or it could be we don't know so so I, th I think this meeting would welcome a bit of clearer kind of insight in, in into that are there any more points or questions uh mick butler first and then councillor max all right thank you chair uh, just around sickness absence basically i I've, I've got to say i'm quite disappointed that neither ourselves unison or the staff forum were actually involved in the, the discussions around the new management of sickness absence and certainly under the new the new structure of the staff forum i would have thought that would have been something that could have definitely been done as somebody who, who's, who's been a train user for many years and represented people around absenteeism and, and have used both the bradford factor and and the sort of the new the new thing that's coming in i'm quite interested as to why we're moving away from the bradford factor um, and just whether it was actually considered to consider con continue with the Bradford factor, but actually to reduce the trigger figure. 
um, because I personally believe Brad Factor is, is, is a better way of looking at absence because it does what it's supposed to do and pick up short-term absences as opposed to, to, to long-term absences, which usually are judged to be genuine absence because obviously once you go into a long-term absence, you've got to see a doctor, you've got to be signed off. Um, and that obviously needs to be taken into consideration. Um, so it's really a question is why was that considered and if so why was the decision taken to move to, to, to the other the other type of, uh, of um, monitoring. Um, I also have real concerns around that. Um, A because it hasn't really been briefed out that well. We're already starting now to move into the situation where people are now being called in on, on informal or formal disciplinary procedures around their absenteeism which has obviously moved from where they would have been if we were still working under the Bradford Fund. Um, and that's causing a lot of concern for people. I also have quite a bit of concern because at the moment we, we seem to be operating within um, the country and the sort of policy at the moment within the government around illnesses. And there's a lot of people with ongoing illnesses such as, as mental health issues, um, I think MS, MS epilepsy, who these people actually, 60% of their time, are probably more than fit to work. Unfortunately, 40% of the time, they probably can't even get out of bed. And obviously what's happening within the world now, within this country, is what they're saying is, because you're fit 60% of the time, then you're fit to work and we're going to stop your benefits and you need to go and find employment. And obviously what we're saying as an organisation is actually, we expect 98% of the time working uh, and so you know how do we employ those type of people uh, and it concerns me like point 6.2 you know around disability I mean we're saying the percentage of staff with disabilities at the council shows a decrease which is a continuing trend it almost seems like we're patting ourselves on the back that we're not actually employing disabled people and that you know is a real concern to me uh, and I am aware that we have got people within the organisation that do have illnesses, um, like MS, um, diabetes, I'm aware of Crohn's disease, for example, that most of the time they will attend work, but they're not going to be able to commit themselves to 98% of being able to work. And I just really want to understand how we're going to approach that issue, because it's not really defined in here uh, around how, how we're going to do that. Um, uh, there's, there's a stuff in here at the 4.3, um, which is obviously talking about managers, uh, the need for quality return to work interviews, developing line manager capability and responsibility for proactively managing staff sickness absence and their wider well-being. And as Shella will tell you, I mean, that's something I've been pushing for since I've been here. It, it, it is about managing it. It's about having managers that know how to manage it and being able to do that. And again, the question is, how are we going to train these managers into being in that position because at the moment we've got a lot of managers that are not capable of managing. Thanks. Mick, th thank you very much. You, you've made some very valid points which, which come direct from your members and obviously you care about those. Um, this, this committee has noted those comments and, and we, we'll be thinking about them and, and I mean that very, very sincerely and I hope you'll take that back to your members. Um, I'm going to ask um, Mrs. Shella Smith to answer those, but in, in doing that, can I ask you to do one thing? When, when you talk about the issue of a Bradford factor, in very broad terms, can you please talk, uh, you just explain the differences between the Brad fa Bradford fact factor and the way we do it now, just, just to highlight the differences for those who aren't completely clear on it. Okay, um, to start with the Bradford factor then, that um, really only picks up repeated short-term absence as an issue um, and you will see that a significant proportion of our absence here at the council is due to long-term. Um, we, just because somebody is long-term sick and may be genuinely sick, the point is they're not at work and they're not delivering a service and as a council I think we would be irresponsible if we left those people without proactively supporting them to return to work as quickly as possible. So what the Bradford factor does is there's a formula which is actually explained in the glossary of terms um, on page 8 of 70. 
and basically what it does is it looks at the number of occurrences of absence. So if somebody's been off on three occasions in the year, it's three squared times by the total number of days absence. And that would give you then a figure. And our previous trigger point was 250 Bradford points. Now, we found from talking to staff and from managers that people don't necessarily understand that formula. Um, despite attempts to explain it to people, um, and we've been using this trigger over a number of years, um, the first point is that people d have told us that they find it difficult to understand. Um, it doesn't take account of long-term absence. And secondly, it doesn't recognize people who are on part-time hours, for example, because it doesn't pick up if uh, those people who are working part-time or on flexible hours, it doesn't um, they have to have twice the level of absence, if you like, in order to hit the 250 absence point trigger. For me, though, I think the most important issue is that for the last 10 years, our absence levels here at the council have been above those um, of councils on our neighbouring councils, councils in our family group, um, who are all going through similar issues to us. Um, and yet our absence levels are higher. And for me, that indicates that we need to do something differently. Um, and one of the things that has been shown in the CIPD absence management survey that we've um, outlined in this report is the fact that reviewing trigger points and monitoring periods can be very successful in terms of making an impact on reducing sickness absence, which I think is to the benefit of all staff, not just those who are off sick, but also their colleagues who are picking up work, managers who are dealing with that in their absence, and, and not forgetting most importantly our residents who at the end of the day might suffer as a result of people not being at work and the service therefore being impacted as a result. That is why we made the decision to change the monitoring period. We did look at having a reduced number of Bradford factor points, but we still felt that that would give rise to the issue of people not really understanding how the Bradford factor is calculated and its actual impact um, on service delivery at the end of the day. So that's why we've moved instead to what we hope is a more straightforward trigger point of two occasions of absence or 2% of working time in a, in a six month period. We are taking steps now to um, spread that message throughout the organization so that everybody is aware of those revised trigger points. And I would make the point that that's all they are. They are just trigger points. They are just a flag for a manager to say, to have a conversation, a quality conversation with member of staff around what the issues are um, in terms of their absence. In most cases, those conversations are not disciplinary in nature. They're not covered under the disciplinary procedure. They're covered under the sickness absence procedure. But the quality, the conversation that you have will depend on the individual circumstances, whether they've had a previous brilliant attendance record and then there's been a blip, um, or whether they actually do have a significant period of repeated short-term absence, or they may have a you know, a serious condition that's a one-off that they're receiving treatment for. So the, the, all the trigger point is is, a, is a, a trigger for the manager to sit down with an employee and have a quality conversation with them around what those issues are, hopefully with the idea of nipping that absence in the bud by dealing with it proactively and getting that person back to work more quickly. Um, in terms of um, 6.2, Mick, just your point there around the number of people um, with disabilities, there's certainly no judgment placed to that statement. It is purely a statement. Um, and the um, result of the, the change there has purely been made because one individual has left and two individuals who previously reported themselves to be disabled are now reporting themselves to be not disabled. Um, there is no sinister reason behind that because I have actually looked into those cases myself with exactly the same thought, is it, that they think it might be a problem if they report themselves as disabled. And having looked into the background of those two cases, I'm convinced that that's not the case at all. So I hope that helps to answer. Thank you. W would you like to come back on that one at all, Mick? Yeah, I mean, just on the disabled, I mean, I did sort of understand that. It was just, it was just like the wording was almost like we're looking to reduce that. And, and obviously that, that's important that we make sure, you know, we look at different disabled people as well. Um, as I say, I mean, I, take, I, I do fully take the, the points you're making. Um, and 
as I say, I'm just a little bit disappointed that we didn't have the discussion and we could have looked at a, a way forward and whether it was about the fact of reducing the trigger points or, or the way you're going forward. Um, I would have felt we, we could have had that conversation and that would have given us the opportunity as well to let people know of what was happening because it's sort of here. It's almost at the moment like it seems like we're using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. I think the important thing is, like you say, quite right, um, that obviously when people are finding themselves in this position, it is around the quality of the management and the way the management approach it uh, and, that, and that is a little bit of a concern I've got around you know, we, we maybe have put the, the horse before the cart because have we actually trained the managers in able to be able to do that? At the moment, I'm not sure that we have. And maybe we should have done that first before then we obviously moved into this new system. Um, the Bradford factor, personally, I think the Bradford factor is easier to understand than 2% of your working time. That's quite a difficult bit of maths. The Bradford factor is quite simple maths. So I'm still not quite sure how the Bradford factor is, is, is more complicated than the 2% of the time. I'm, Two absences, everybody can understand. Absolutely, you know, go off sit twice in, in in six months, then you know you're going to you're going to have that discussion, and possibly depending what the thing is. The other thing is what worries me to a certain extent. What it will encourage people possibly to do is rather than have one day of absence, they might think, well, hang on a minute, two percent, I can go off four days rather than the one day. And I think people will think along that, which obviously again won't help the. The, the, the rest of the team, etc. Um, and also, I think it puts a lot of pressure on people perhaps returning or coming into work when they shouldn't. And, and anybody's viral infection could end up being an epidemic. So there's concerns around that as well. And I think, you know, there's lots of issues we need to do. It's a big piece of work. Hopefully, we work together to get through and, and get to where we need to be. Would anyone else like to ask any questions or to comment on this one? Um, I don't know who put the hand up first. Uh, Councillor Mrs Baker. Um, thank you. I, I wonder if... Uh, I, I do agree with the point that Councillor uh, Sanders made about um, the helpfulness of having an average days lost, and perhaps there is a different statistic that we can use. Uh, the mean isn't the same as the average. And perhaps um, uh, we might find a, a, a different statistic that will be more informative without risking um, the, um, uh, uh, the risk, without the risk of personal information being inadvertently um, passed on. Um, I can't help but think that having um, a, a referral for a, 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 an interview after two occasions of absence in six months, um, I, I just wonder whether that's an effective point at which to have, have the trigger. I can, um, I can understand or 2% of available time but I mean, if it means I, I have, um, um, you know, a bad cold and don't come in one day and have to go to the dentist and have a tooth out one day and, uh, and don't feel up to coming in, that means I, my line manager has to interview me. doesn't seem to be a very good use of my line manager's time. Um, I can understand if, if there is a trigger which is... Um, two occasions um, or a number of days, but just you know, taking two odd days off for unrelated and fairly minor things doesn't, doesn't seem good management time. Um, and are managers given training on how to approach these interviews? And um, finally, why, why was it that staff side weren't consulted on the change? Thank you, Mrs. Baker. Um, in terms of the trigger point, um, we have actually started, um, in terms of corporately, reporting on percentage of working time lost as well. Um, there is an easy way of working that out. In, in a year, there are 260 working days. And so if you're off for 
my maths is terrible, I'm going to embarrass myself now, if you're for 26 days, that's 10% of your working time, is that right? Yeah, so thank you. Um, so we have started reporting on that corporately, so we could certainly use that figure in addition to average days off, if that would assist. Um, in terms of the um, trigger point for a meeting with an individual, in fact, managers should be having good quality return to work interviews with a member of their staff after every single period of absence, no matter how long or short that is. And there is stacks of evidence out there which shows that effective, good quality return to work interviews are one of the most um, effective ways of actually having an impact on sickness absence because it lets the individual know that they've been missed um, and it also gives the manager an opportunity to explain the impact that that absence has had in terms of service delivery but more than anything it nips any issues in the bud if they have a quality conversation it's the way that the conversation is carried out it's not supposed to be um, as a, you know a big stick um, that we wave at people to say how dare you have any time off of work what it's supposed to be is a good quality conversation between a member of staff and their manager to say you know sorry you weren't here are you better now are you sure you're well enough to be back at work first issue um, and if you are this is what you missed while you were away and also just to you know to let you know that um, are there are there any issues that um, you have that we need to look at are there any issues in terms of your workload is something happening at home but in terms of the taking the time to have a good quality conversation um, with an individual and it may in many cases be literally five minutes but it's how it's done and what's said that is the most important thing and so I do strongly feel that having an occasion actually having a meeting like that after every single period of absence is important but perhaps to have something a little bit more in depth after two occasions I do feel that's a reasonable approach to nip issues in the bud for the benefit as I say of the employee as well as the individual um, in terms of training we did actually deliver training to well over a hundred managers um, about a year ago that training is ongoing um, and we are looking at delivering some more training for managers around that having difficult conversations um, where those are needed um, and doing good quality return to work interviews and also our team of HR business partners will coach managers on a one-to-one -one basis if there is a particularly difficult um, issue in terms of the consultation we've not changed the sickness absence policy all we've done is reviewed the trigger points um, so in terms of consultation I do appreciate mix mix point we've certainly had conversations with Unison in the past regularly about sickness absence levels um, and certainly we've we've discussed views and so on but in terms of changing the trigger points no we didn't consult formally with Unison but we don't feel that that is a change to the procedure as such Councillor Eyre, I think it was next. There's Councillor Marx. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've just got uh, one question relating to Table 2 on page 8 of 14, um, or 14 of 70, um, about staff suspensions. Um, can I just be clear that the, the two that are reported here, so, so you're saying that these suspensions are now no longer uh, being applied, so these, these employees have returned to work. It's not six weeks that started six weeks ago and is ongoing? Um, both employees have been dismissed for gross misconduct. So they are no longer suspended. Thank you. Um, and, and just really so, so that I can totally understand that uh, in one case it, it was two weeks before that happened and in another case it was six. Is that simply down to the complexity of the case? Uh, is there any way that six weeks can perhaps be reduced? It's a long time for both sides, isn't it, for someone to be uh, suspended? We would always try to keep any period of suspension as short as possible. Um, the two-week case was straightforward would be not quite the right phrase to use but it but it was less complex yes thank you um, the six-week case part of that will built um, was built in to allow the employee longer to um, prepare their case um, and for them to get representation to come to um, a hearing with them so sometimes it's it's not it, it's not necessarily that as an employer we're um, trying to delay the process it might be that an employee has asked for a little bit longer to prepare and so on Councillor Marks. Thank you, Chair. If we look at 6.1, top of 12 of 70, if I'm reading it right, 80% of applicants didn't want to answer with their ethnicity. 
And then if we look at the table 19 of 70, only 1.4 of existing staff didn't want to. Does this indicate that new people don't wish to answer ethnicity questions? Because I can fully understand it. And I'm unsure why ethnicity is so important to us. Everybody's the same, colour, legs, everything. So are we obliged to keep this information? Because to me, we're wasting people's time. Or is it a legal obligation? It is a legal obligation. Um, we have a, uh, under the public sector equality duty, we have a, um, an, a, a requirement on us to foster good relations. Um, and we also have an equalities target to um, have a, a, a diverse workforce that reflects aspirationally the population of the borough. So that is why we collect this information so that we can use it if there are issues. Um, we can actually use this information. The information on table 12 um, on page 19 is applicants for jobs as opposed to new staff so um, they perhaps might be more reluctant to say what their ethnicity or gender or whatever it might be is because they they perhaps perceive that that might be used against them in some way um, in terms of their actual application um, we tend to find that people are more happy to say um, once they are an actual member of staff, so um, people, te you know, tend to be more willing to divulge that information when they're actually an employee. Hopefully, that answers your question. That answers that one. It's just a tick box exercise, so I'll accept that. Um, the next accidents and um, illnesses. I don't know whether other employers are typical or atypical, but certainly in some areas, it's looked at whether the accident or illness was incurred at work or not at work and the attitude taken from the employer to the employee is slightly different if they go skiing and break a leg and they're off that is treated differently to if they've got the accident at work so at work accidents are treated much uh, or basically much nicer to the employee do we actually have any I know it's different where stress is, because the stress can be divorce at home or here or whatever. I do accept there's crossovers. But do we have any data of how much is at work or at home? Yes, we do record that, and it's reported to this committee um, through the annual health, safety, and well-being report. Um, the last, um, on an annual basis, so the last one was in June of this year, so the next report will be in June of next year. Um, so yeah, we can certainly we do we certainly do have that information. It is reported to this committee on an annual basis. It might be useful, but I don't know quite how to actually incorporate it in these tables. But that's separate. Um, and the other point is page 15 of 70 at the top. There's a target of eight average days lost of sickness. Could you just explain how we arrived at eight? And you know, are we encouraging people to actually use it? Yes, there's always a danger with having a target that people see that as an allowance and it's a sort of a sickness entitlement, absolutely, so it is danger. I, 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 would, I would like to think that that wasn't the case here. Um, we arrived at that figure, it's actually been eight days as our target for a number of years. Um, originally it was a best value performance indicator target, so it's that, that, it's that old, that's where it came from historically and we set the target at eight a number of years ago um, based on our absence levels at that time. Unfortunately we've never actually achieved that target, um, so that's why we've maintained it at eight days. But when you look at sort of public sector averages, which as we know this year is 8.7 days, as you'll have seen in the report um, and when we look at the averages from other councils in Hampshire and so on we felt that eight days was a reasonable target to maintain. Um, I believe at another committee somewhere we said we wanted to be in the upper quartile for officers pay. I believe that's gone through some committee somewhere. So if this can be right. So if we want to be in the upper quartile which has already gone through committee and been agreed surely that should apply to everything. I don't think it does if we're keeping the eight. Um, Mick um, Butler, I think you put your hand up earlier on. I, I didn't pick up on you. You're okay. Any more points or questions on this paper? Okay. Um, section 2.1, it, it, it's recommended that the committee note 
the contents of the report, so it's just for noting. Is anyone happy to note this report? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And our final paper this evening is pay benchmarking another report from Head of Service, Shell Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, the pay policy statement includes a statement that the Council will benchmark its pay and benefits against a comparator group by carrying out a full market pay review every five years if required. The last full market pay review was carried out in 2005 and since 2010 this committee has annually reviewed whether or not the timing is right to carry out such a review. In 2012, the committee agreed to carry out pay and benefits benchmarking, which was undertaken by an external consultant. Um, and that was, in effect, a mini market pay review because we did actually end up benchmarking all, virtually all posts at the council. Um, that work was completed in February this year, so it is still very current um, and showed us that um, for 82% of our posts, we were in the upper quartile. Um, this committee also said, though, that it wanted to review whether a full market pay review should be undertaken in December 2013, hence this report to you now. Um, we're recommending to you that a market pay review is not carried out at the current time due to the continuing economic uncertainty and the Council's own budgetary position. Um, and further, it's recommended that unless there is a significant economic upturn resulting in increased turnover and or difficulties recruiting, um, that that decision is reviewed by this committee in June 2015. Um, and then this would enable any issues arising from the review to be considered in the medium term financial strategy in October 2015 and be incorporated in the following year's budget. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Shella. Any, any questions or comments? Regarding that, please. Councillor Leek. It's a comment, really. I, I just have to say that personally, I am not in favour of pay benchmarking or comparisons or anything else. It's why we've got far too many senior chief executives of large groups being grossly overpaid, in my view, because they employ some headhunter to produce evidence that somebody else is getting a little bit more and it leads to inflation and jealousy and everything else. And um, I'm not in favor of it full stop. So uh, this paper, the recommendation certainly has made. Any other points or comments? Mick Butler, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, I, I tend to agree. I think it would be a waste of money to look at uh, a benchmarking. Uh, and I think, you know, we would probably find that we are still in the, the top, top never say it could tell. Um, but uh, one of the issues I want to raise, um, and I don't know whether it is relevant, but I think it is, obviously Unison are actually at the moment running a campaign to pay the living wage. Uh, and I would ask this committee to certainly consider that and for this council to sign up to that, that pledge. The minimum wage at the moment within this area is £7.45. Quite rightly, when we, when we wrote to the chief executive, earlier in the year, he responded by saying that all directly recruited staff within the council are on or above that rate, which is correct. But to sign up is we're asking to actually consider making sure that people that are contracted in to do work for or on behalf of the council are also paying that living wage. Uh, and it's, it was quite concerning to us quite recently when we discovered that one worker who's been outsourced for quite a length of time was not only being paid living wage but was not even being paid minimum wage and I know that that situation has now been addressed but I think it's important that the council sign up to look to make sure that any contracts they use anybody that does work on behalf of this council should be being paid the living wage and I hope this committee will take that away considering it perhaps report back come from the next committee. Uh, the other thing I'd, I'd like to raise at this point is uh, three years ago the government obviously when they did the pay for it um, actually um, said at that time that they would pay a one-off 250 rise to those people under the £21,000, which obviously they, they then did a U-turn. But thankfully, the last two years, this council has paid the £250 lump sum to employees under £21,000. Um, obviously, Tony said this year that that wasn't going to be on the table and it wasn't there. What I would also like this committee to go away and consider is working towards 
making sure that we have no employees under the 21,000 threshold, which I think is about um, the spinal column 20, 24, anybody a bloke, spinal column 24. So again, if we do a piece of work and report that, this committee to look at the possibility of moving towards that, that position. Thank you. If I give you an, uh, an officer uh, response to that, just to start with, in terms of the living wage, just for members' benefit, and I think Mick did say this, but um, our pay policy statement aspiration is to be in the upper quartile. All of our staff are paid, all of our directly employed staff are paid above the living wage. Um, so just to reassure you um, on that point. We'd like to come back on that one, are you? You're happy? Okay. Anyone else like to, to have a question or comment the paper or anything that's been said so far? If not, then the recommendation on this paper is that a market pay review is not carried out at the current time and that decision is reviewed in June 2015. Is that agreed by committee? Oh, yeah, Councillor Mrs Baker. Apologies. Um, could, could we add the, the two points that Unison raised so that we agree the decision there and further ask for a report uh, to a future meeting on signing up to the living wage and also that just small piece of work to see if the, we have any members of staff under that level. I'm going to ask Cheryl Swift to respond to that one, but, but in, in doing so, I would have to put that to the committee as a, as a motion, obviously have that approved. Um, Cheryl Smith, would you like to comment on that one? Just in terms of signing up to the living wage, um, to the next committee in March, we have a report coming on the pay policy statement, and it would seem to make sense to me that if it was something that this committee um, wanted us to explore, that it could be brought forward as part of that paper if the committee was agreeable. Um, and the second point about members of staff who are earning under 21,000, we currently follow the National Pay and Conditions um, Agreement for local government services, and I think um, it would require a move away from national pay. Um, so I suppose uh, I, my, my um, understanding was that Unison's pr preference is for us to follow national pay. Um, so I'm not sure. From an, from an officer perspective, I just wondered if Mick could perhaps give a comment on that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you're quite right. I mean, we as, as a branch um, will stick with the national pay agreement. Um, but it's just, again, if you're saying you're in the upper quarter, and obviously the government are saying 21,000 is the figure that they're looking as a low paid worker, uh, and we as a council want to be in that upper quarter, surely we should be looking towards moving in that direction. Councillor Leake? I don't think this committee should be getting involved in pay or discussions about pay. Um, we do approve certain matters relating to pay, but we don't actually negotiate. I would have thought it wasn't our role uh, to, to get involved in these detailed discussions. Thank you. If no, Councillor Mrs. Eaches. Thank you, Chair. And obviously, if we're getting into discussions over setting minimum wages, you're then looking at things like trainee solicitors, like the Law Society set the little amount you can pay them, and that's the whole point because they're being trained on the job and um, apprenticeships and things. So we need. I think it's a bit more complicated than just agreeing it here tonight. I, I do have to agree that that the issue of setting pay is beyond the bounds of this committee and, and there are mechanisms in place for, 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 for doing that. If no one else has any more questions or comments, I will call this meeting to a close. Thank you all very much and, and good night.